Hi, and welcome to Conversations with Robin. You may recall last week's program was with Greg Braden and we were filming at the Maritime Museum. Well, guess what? We're back here again. And today's guest is a man who is also internationally renowned. And he's internationally renowned as a biological scientist who is bridging science and spirituality. Please welcome Dr. 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 Bruce Lipton. <laughs> Hi, Robin. <laughs> How are you? Absolutely wonderful, thank you. And you said it's okay for me to call you Bruce. I would hope you would, thank you. We're, we're a little bit informal on this show. So am I, actually. And speaking of um, informal and therefore formalities, I also wanted to give a plug to uh, Chris Hooper Promotions. Chris has brought out Bruce and Greg and is doing some amazing work in getting the, w the, the work of the likes of, of Bruce and Greg out into Australia. So an acknowledgement to Chris Hooper Promotions for allowing us to actually connect with you and have you on the show. Well, she's a wonderful woman. She takes care of us beautifully and allows us to visit this beautiful country. Because you've done a bit of travelling around, where to? With Quite a bit. Well, I just uh, spent a few months in New Zealand and mm -hmm. uh, popping here before going to Europe. And have you been travelling all this time with Greg, dovetailing your program? No, we just come together a few times a year and uh, it's just a wonderful opportunity when we get a chance to meet outside the United States where we enjoy ourselves quite a lot. Okay. We're going to be talking obviously a little bit about your personal journey. First though, for those people that aren't aware of what Bruce Lipton does, what is your work in the world? Well, I'm a cellular biologist, mm -hmm. and my research uh, was uh, especially re evolved uh, around cloning stem cells. Now, stem cells, of course, are a very hot topic today, and everybody's looking at the medical implications of stem cells. And it's interesting because I actually started cloning stem cells in 1967, and that was 40 years ago. Wow. So uh, uh, I might consider myself a pioneer in uh, stem cell research. Absolutely. And uh, more interesting is that I caught on to the very powerful information that stem cells could offer us years ago. And the information was so powerful that at some point I realized that uh, what I was teaching in medical school, I was a professor in a medical school, that uh, the information I was teaching medical students about how life worked uh, really conflicted with the results from my experiments on stem cells. So much so, in fact, that at some point I realized I was out of integrity by staying in and knowingly teaching medical students uh, incorrect information about uh, genetics and pathology and, and just the nature of life itself. So uh, I left the system. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and did? Uh, what's that? And, and did what? Oh, well, during the leaving the system, it was really strange. That was one of those, like, what do you call, midlife crises. Mm -hmm. And so I left behind my family and my job and everything else and uh, went on the road and produced a rock and roll show. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, not being a, much of a rock and roll entrepreneur, I really lost everything I had, but I was uh, uh, instrumental in bringing to, to the world a man by the name of Yanni. Yes. And I, uh, he was, uh, I found him, he was a PhD student getting a degree in psychology, and I heard him play music, and I said, well, if you can play music like that, what do you need a PhD in psychology for? Mm -hmm. And so uh, I pulled him out of school and, and set him up, and we put a show on. And, uh, that's, that's how it all started, but uh, I fortunately ended up going back into the biological sciences again. I had an opportunity after a hiatus from the university to end up at Stanford University School of Medicine, mm -hmm. where I was uh, employed to do uh, more research on, on the stem cells and uh, further my investigations. Uh, published a few papers at Stanford and then uh, realized that uh, my correct decision the first time of leaving academia to do it again because there was great resistance to this new information because it, uh, it really conflicted with the established teachings in the medical school. Okay. And I believe also, and I don't know if that was in that time frame, that you had a motorbike accident? Oh yeah, I had a very serious one. Uh, I was in the Caribbean. I was teaching mm -hmm. in the Caribbean. Was that uh, about this time frame? That we're talking about? Yes, I was in between yeah. uh, the University of Wisconsin and Stanford University. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was being very foolish and I was thinking to myself just before the accident, how wonderful, I'm living on an island where they don't even have a speed limit. So I thought, oh, isn't that cool as I accelerated my motorcycle and, and, <laughs> and so much glee of going that fast, uh, came on a 90 degree corner on a hill uh, going down and I was really flying and then flew and went straight off the corner and turned the bike upside down and, and uh, landed on my head and, and uh, dragged the bike and me for, through the bush for a while. And uh, I was unconscious for about, I think, 40 minutes or so. And uh, my other faculty colleagues thought I was dead or dying. 
and uh, came out of it, but um, was a little bit broken and beaten up in the process. Mm. And but this really led to an opening of my eyes uh, to something, and that was this: is that uh, being in a medical school at the time and teaching, uh, my medical colleagues did the best they could for me. They they gave me a bunch of pain pills. Say, well, this will help you out. And there I was all doubled up like Quasimodo, trying to walk away with everything hurting me in my body, and I couldn't even walk. And uh, the next day, uh, one of the students uh, told me that another student in the class was a chiropractor. Mm -hmm. And uh, having you know, been a teacher in a medical school, my only experience with chiropractors is what I've heard through the halls, that uh, these were great quacks. So uh, I, I never had any appreciation for them at all, and yet I was in a real bad place. And, and this person said, well, that chiropractor could help you. And I thought, this is no time to, to, to question. This was, this, I'll try anything. So uh, it was my biggest surprise. I went to this chiropractor, and I learned a couple of things. But the most important thing that came out of that was he did his chiropractic adjustment on me. And while I came in there all hunched up and bent over, I walked out of that place standing up and I realized, well, my colleagues gave me pills so I wouldn't feel the pain and the chiropractor allowed me to walk out of here and I had great respect for that profession after that and uh, actually since that time have I, I teach in chiropractic uh, colleges right now. And I believe this was also the time you came into contact with kinesiology. Yes, this was something new to me, muscle testing. I had no idea what that meant, so I, I asked the chiropractor, as I said, uh, when I went in there with a, a disbelief about chiropractic, and I asked him, I said, well, show me something, you know, I just like, show me something. And he said, well, do you know about muscle testing? I said, I have no idea what that means. So he said, uh, hold out your arm, and I held out my arm, and he said, uh, say your name, and I'll put pressure on your arm, and you resist. And so I thought, well, this is silly, but I'll do it. So I hold out my arm, and I say my name, Bruce, and he pushes down on my arm, and I'm, my arm is pretty rock solid. And I'm thinking, so? Now he says, put out your arm again, but this time say your name is somebody else, like say a woman's name, like Mary. So I said, okay, you know, this is still silly. I hold out my arm, and I say, my name is Mary, and he pushes down, and my arm drops, and I say, first thing I say is, well, wait, I wasn't ready. Let me, I wasn't ready. Let me try that again. I wasn't prepared. And so I hold out my arm now with the anticipation, of course, I'm going to be really strong. So I hold out my arm, and I say, my name is Mary, and again, my, he pushed my arm, and it dropped, and, I, and all of a sudden, I started to realize that my mind, my conscious mind, which was intending to hold my arm strong, uh, I couldn't do it. And, and when I would say my name, would, my arm would be strong. And when I would say something that wasn't true, my arm would fall. And I, I said, well, what, what does all this mean? And all of a sudden, I, that's where I started to realize there are two minds mm -hmm. involved here. Mm -hmm. My conscious mind with the intention of holding it strong and my subconscious mind, which didn't agree with the statement and led to the weakness. The big shock was this, though. I realized that I have these two minds, number one, but the subconscious mind was stronger than my conscious mind because I couldn't override it. And all of a sudden in my head, this vision came and said, oh my goodness, well, what other thoughts might be in my subconscious mind that I don't agree with? For the reason is, if it's stronger than my conscious mind, then it will overpower my conscious mind. And that was an awakening to the reality that we operate from these two different minds, but they're not equal and that the subconscious mind is profoundly more powerful in controlling our lives than we had even given it credit for. I found that fascinating in the, in the book, in reading about that, Bruce, and this was in uh, Bruce's latest book, Biology of Belief, which we'll talk about more as we go into the program. We need to take a break. When we come back, though, I'm curious to find out how your work changed after being introduced to kinesiology. Wonderful. See you after the break. Thank you. 